we're ready to get started again. <clears throat> My name is Barbara Thomas, and I am before you to introduce our next speakers. Um, our first, uh, before I do that, I just want to make one comment. You know, I'm a Republican for about six years now, and I'm one of those re uh, Republicans that self-recruited. <laughs> I was sitting in front of my TV one day, and I, that was right, right before, uh, right, yeah, right before our president became president. And you know, I was so fed up with what I was hearing. I got up, I took myself up, and went to my computer, and I changed parties. <laughs> You, it has been training city ever since then. I educated myself, and before then, actually, since I've been voting since the age of 18, I have been voting uh, the conservative way. You know, that's the way I was raised. And, you know, since then, you know, it's, it's, it was kind of like changing, six years ago, it was kind of like just changing parties. That's all I did, change parties. But I believe what I believe. And I have believed it for years. So, amen. I just wanted to say that. Uh, we have three speakers that are coming up, and the first one is Stacy Swimp. I must keep wanting to say shrimp. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Ain't too bad. Uh, Mr. Swimp is president of the uh, Frederick Douglass Society, whose mission is based on concepts and principles of individual freedom for all. Swimp, Mr. Swimp is also a spokesperson for the Project 21 uh, Black Leadership Network. Yes. Oh, okay. I'll be Stacy. Oh, yes. I'll be Stacy. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Julia. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Wait. Uh, I'll be Stacy. You'll be Stacy? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, we're going to have um, Reverend C.L. speak in this place, Mr. Swim. Okay, uh, the next speaker, Tom Borelli, he is here, right? Yes. Oh. <laughs> right here. Yeah, now he's here. I'm here. All right. Uh, Mr. Borelli is the senior fellow with the Freedom Works and an authority on energy policy and crony capitalism. As a shareholder activist, uh, he has directly challenged uh, CEOs for adopting business strategies that seek to uh, directly uh, profit from the growth of government and regulations such as Obamacare and cap and trade. And then we'll hear finally from Mr. Ryan Bomberger. And Mr. Bomberger is the Chief Creative Officer of the Radiance Foundation, an educational life affirming 501c3 organization. Through creative and creative ads and campaigns and compassionate community outreach, he illuminates social issues in connection in context of the God-given purpose. And that he deals with is uh, pro-life, which is my background. And uh, we're very pleased to have these guys with us. And uh, uh, Mr. C.L., you're going to come up right now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, Stacy Swimp is a, an acquaintance of mine that uh, that lives in um, Trent, Flint, Flint, Michigan, and he could not be here today. And so I'm going to share with you um, a little bit about economics, uh, which is my which is a background of mine. I um, was in uh, the finance world for many years. In fact, I retired from that before. Um, Citibank bought out the associates. I was an associate, and uh, I, in making the transition from um, liberal to conservative, I was uh, actually a part of the beginning of the housing crash. I made loans to folks, I'm making a confession now, to folks who did not deserve them. And I understand how uh, that happened and, and what did happen there. I encourage all of you to stick around uh, after I sit down. I'm not going to. I'm going to be very brief. For Tom Borelli, and I said last night for those of you who were not in the room, 
uh, when Tom Borelli comes into uh, any room uh, and you talk about uh, the smartest guy in the room, it's going to be Tom. Tom is a man of great uh, achievement, uh, not only academically, but uh, he has an incredibly fantastic mind. And I think we're all going to benefit from uh, his knowledge and uh, his learning. And then uh, Ryan um, has an incredible story that uh, we are going to all be blessed uh, in sharing in. And I want to thank all of you, and this is for the internet audience. Uh, usually the first outing of an event like this does not meet with the type of success that this outing has met with. And I want to again thank Scott and Christy for their efforts uh, in, in this. I want to thank our friends at Freedom Works uh, and all of our friends, uh, Deneen and Starr, who helped uh, uh, make this possible. Bill, your words were uh, just absolutely uh, inspiring. And uh, thank you so much. Folks, we um, were a part of, uh, Jane was a part of it, and I was a part of an idea that was shared with us some years ago in Dallas County. Uh, we called ourselves, or it was called the Top 20 Club, talking about empowering a community, and reinvesting in the community, and finding ways to do that. One of the things that Star and I talk about sometimes is this. Black folks, in many cases, have a very unhealthy relationship with money. And I'm not saying this to uh, belittle us or anything, but in order to be healed, we have to identify the illness. And our illness has been not only the unhealthy uh, relationship that we have with money, but we also have a difficulty in trusting one another. Yeah. Now, the top 20 club, what do we do? 20 men and women of ethnic backgrounds, although it was not ex uh, inclusive, exclusive in that, in that uh, makeup, but that's the way it was, it's the way it happened uh, nearly 20 years ago. We pledge to one another that every quarter, every three months, we would get together at a designated location and we would bring to that location $3,000 of our own money. And we put that money on the table in the hands of our appointed and elected treasurer. And on that table, in that particular uh, quarter, in that particular three month period, you had $60,000 of 20 dedicated people who pledged to invest it. If we could not find a property or a business or a cause to invest that $60,000 in, the next quarter we came and we brought another $3,000 you have $120,000 on the table. Now if we found a property or a business to invest that money in, if we bought a, a, an apartment, small apartment complex, if we bought a, a, a dry cleaners, if we bought uh, something of that nature, then it was important that you employ the people in the community where you purchased that and then give them the opportunity to purchase that business from you so that they can have a business of their own and you sell it to them at profit thus teaching them the power of free market and the capitalist system if we didn't find any money or anybody to uh 
uh, anything to invest in that, that quarter. Of course, we, we went on, we went on until finally, after a year's period of time, you had $240,000. Now that's a good down payment sometimes on properties, uh, even housing. In which case you find some of the young men in the community, if you have been able to purchase five or six houses, you now place him in business with a lawn service that upkeeps that property. Then you have a handyman, you have a plumber, or you have someone who you might be able to send to technical school to teach them a trade in order to take care of your properties and then give them the idea not just to take care of them but to own it. Sell it to them at cost or not at cost but sell it to them at profit. You don't scalp them but you sell it to them at profit. Usually property values appreciate. Now we did not worry about anyone running off with the money because we had something that is missing and it's not being taught to our young people today. We had something among ourselves that was missing, not just the word integrity, not just the word trust, but in order for us to be healthy financially, in order for us to have a right relationship, there is a word that black folks need to re-infuse into our vocabulary and ground it into our children, and that word is honor. Mm, we need to be people of honor. There was a time, and I came from this type of family, my grandfather and grandmother, my mother and my father, my uncles and my aunts, all of them had one mantra for us kids as we were growing up. Don't you bring any shame on this family. Right. Honor. That is something that is missing. This led us to where we are today in the, in the film. We asked this one question. How can you value, if we don't value the beating hearts inside the womb, how can you value the beating hearts outside of the womb? The murder rate in Chicago is there because you have people who feel abortion is something that is normal. You have a generation of young people today where you have uh, activities going on on a social scale, gay marriage, abortion, those types of things going on on a social scale that if grandma and grandpa Nim was to come back and see the things that we're voting for and some of the things we stand for, they think we lost our mind. But folks, I've come to tell you the things that were decent 30, 40, 50 years ago, they're still decent. The things that were right 30, 40, 50 years ago, they're still right. But as far as re-empowering, reinvesting in the community, so many people say it can't be done, but 20 years ago, and we just didn't do this in one area of the country. We did this all over the country because the top 20 came from different sectors of America. If you choose to do something like this, I encourage you to choose carefully the people you surround yourself with. But it can be done. You can make a difference. And then don't be silent about it. Now, I know it's a Christian principle that when you help someone, be quiet about it. But when we're talking about doing something, when we're under attack as conservatives and as Republicans, and I have to say this, listen, I understand, I understand, and K. Carl, and I wanted him here, I wanted to invite him here, I wanted all the Frederick Douglass folks here. I understand, don't misunderstand what K. Carl was saying. 
He was saying that when you walk into a barbershop, don't just go in there and say, hey, I'm a Republican, I'm a conservative, you guys are idiots. Don't, don't go in there doing that. Don't go in there saying that. That's what he was saying. Because the fact of the matter is, I am a conservative. I am a Republican. And I will not run and hide from that for nobody. And nobody had to tell me what was right for me. I knew what was in my pocketbook. I knew what my children needed. I knew what my mortgage payment was. Black folks got plenty of sense. We are just ignorant of certain truths. So let's find ways, creative ways, to reinvest in our communities. It doesn't take a whole lot of money to do it. You may not need to start off with $3,000. Maybe may start off with $1,000. Maybe start off with $500, but the important thing is you start. And then you do something very positive in that community by letting people see you, not just talk about reinvesting in the community, but actually reinvesting in the community. Let the young people, the young boys, the young girls see you caring about them. For the first time in American history, and this is the preacher in me, I'm taking off my Freedom Works hat and all of that kind of thing. This is the preacher in me. But the first time in American history, we have young people between the ages of 8 and 17 who nearly 50% of them have never seen the inside of a church except for a funeral. Well, I was coming along and I'm uh, knocking on the door of 60. Even the worst kids in the community went to church sometimes. But we live in a society where nearly 50% of that age group has never seen the inside of a church. What does that mean for you and me, Bill? It means that as our sun begins to set, theirs is rising. A godless consciousness. A consciousness that is not shaped or formed in a Judeo-Christian fashion. It means that Bill and I need to keep our guns well oiled. Friends, let's not embrace this foolishness that there are no such thing as a bad kid. There's a society now, as Bill was saying, and Bill, I totally agree with you, that has poisoned the minds of a people thinking that it takes some village to raise a child. Folks, that's a lie. Especially today. Because there are some people in that village who you don't want near your child. That's right. <laughs> so it takes parents. It takes the community. It takes the church. Yes, that forms a village. But it starts at home. God bless you. We're going to bring up Tom... Borelli now, and Tom, you take your time, and uh, yeah, he's bringing up his lovely wife, Deneen Borelli. Um, when Jane and Tom, Jane and Tom and I were in Wyoming, oh, but that's last year sometime, and of course we go out and eat and so forth and so on. And y'all know something invariably, I don't know why this is, but they always think Deneen is my wife, and Jane is Tom's wife. We have to get them straight on that all the time. It, it's the red hair. <laughs> but anyway, Tom Morelli, let's welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you. It's great to be here at this conference. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the general economy in terms of where we are and where we're going. And I guess I could be really optimistic in my tone and style and say I want to inspire and inform you. To be really honest, to be brutally honest, I want to frighten you and motivate you to do what you need to do today and to go back into your communities 
and get more people involved. Because in this prior election, we were at a crossroads. Ladies and gentlemen, we took the wrong turn. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. So now we need to double down and work twice as hard. And I'm going to be throwing a lot of numbers at you. And I'd like some feedback. Because remember, I'm here to frighten and make you angry and get you out in the streets. If the other team can do that, we certainly can. Now, in terms of our economic growth, the only way you really could describe it as slow, moderate. GDP, the measure of our economy, the first quarter of 2013 was 2.5%. I think today they lowered it to 24 It's about the same. The good news about that, it's up from last quarter, where I think it only went up 0.4%. Now let's talk, and going forward, the Federal Reserve predicts that it's going to go down further because of the fiscal cliff deal, the sequestration, plus those tax increases. So that's going to slow economic growth. One number is <clears throat> the remainder of the year may only be 1.5%. Now unemployment, currently it's at 7.5%. Now that's good because it used to be 8%, but the really thing to understand is the unemployment rate that they're, we're being told doesn't include the people who have given up on looking for jobs. So 7.5 looks good, but people have dropped out of the workforce. Really look at that number, the importance is the labor force participation rate, that percentage, and that percentage is simply the number of people that are working and the number of people that can work based on age. And at that number, we're at a 30-year low. Only 63% of those who are capable of working are working. That's the number to focus on because a lot of people have just dropped out or given up. Now, to really frighten you. There's a website out there called Zero Hedge. It's kind of a financial website. And last week, in preparing for my speech, I got to come up with some economic numbers, right? I got to speak to people, make believe like I know what I'm talking about. So as you go to the computer and you find it, so Zero Hedge, they had a web posting where they posted the 40 frightening facts about the fall of the United States economy. I don't have 40 here. That's the, I'm not going to talk about the 40 because I only have so much time. But here, here are some of them. More than 56,000 manufacturing facilities in the United States have closed since 2000, uh, 2001. 56,000 manufacturing sites. Back in 1950, 80% of males were working. Today, only 65%. Again, the labor participation rate. Now this one, really, of all of the 40, this is the one that struck me the most, is at this point, 53% of all American workers make $30,000 or less. Half of our country is only making less than $30,000 or less. Now that's a really important number to focus on. According to the Census Bureau, more than 146 million people are either poor or low income. That's about half the population. Okay, that's the baseline. Census Bureau again, 49% of all American households are receiving some sort of government assistance. That's half the population, or half the households. In 1983, that number was far less, only third of our country. So that's up. More, we have um, the amount of Americans on social security disability now equals the population of Greece. Now, we all know how the progressives love children. Here we go. 45% of all children are living in poverty in Miami. 50% of children are living in poverty in Cleveland. And then there's always Detroit. 60% of children living in Detroit are living in poverty. When Barack Obama became president, 32 million Americans were on food stamps. Today, there's more than 47 million. That's more 
people on food stamps than there is the most populous state, the state of California. Don't be deceived by the stock market price today. Don't be deceived about the mainstream media spin on all this. These are numbers. Now what makes this really worse is that when President Obama became president, our country was about $10 trillion in debt. Now we're $16, $17 trillion in debt. So I was trained in science, I talk about economics, so we often talk about a cost-benefit analysis. It's cost us $7 trillion. What are the benefits? I'm still looking for them. We dug ourselves in a bigger hole and we're not seeing that V-shaped recovery that we really need to see to generate incomes, to generate tax revenue, to get us out of this deficit and debt. This is proof. If no other proof, this is proof that big government programs do not work and actually harm Americans. Now, one of the biggest mistakes, in my view, that President Obama has made, and this is really important to Louisiana, is his energy policy. Now, in 2009, 2009, Barack Obama said, he said that the oil and gas industry was yesterday's energy. And he touted renewables as the energy of tomorrow. That was his message point. That was his view. And ever since then, he's taken a central planning approach. Central planning approach to do everything he possibly can to harm the fossil fuel industry, coal, oil, natural gas, and promote renewable energy, electric cars, wind turbines, solar panels. He's sitting there in the White House almost literally with his hands on the controls and he's pressing the buttons. The free market is really not part of what we're experiencing today. Now since 85% of our energy comes from these traditional energy forms, making this transition is going to be expensive. It's going to harm us economically. Nonetheless, he has embraced a war on fossil fuels. And how has he done this? The really important thing, how has he done this? He's done this all through the regulatory agencies. Two things. He's stopping production slowly, and he's raised the cost of using fossil fuels. That's the way he's lifting all the energy prices. Now, what are the consequences? Well, when energy prices go up, it harms those who least can afford to pay it. It inhibits manufacturing jobs. It results in job losses. That's the immediate consequence of higher energy prices. And the promotion of green energy, what have we gotten? President Obama's invested about $150 billion in green energy subsidies. Again, sitting at those controls. Promote this with tax dollars and whack this one with, re with, with regulations and stopping production. And his timing could not be worse. We have discovered that we are the Saudi Arabia of coal, of natural gas, and oil. His policies could not be worse and at the absolute worst time for our economy. So we've missed huge opportunities. In economic terms, we call that opportunity cost. The opportunity cost of this war on fossil fuels is a disaster. We could be energy independent. We could be creating more high-paying energy jobs. We could be lowering energy prices, putting more money in the pockets of consumers. We could be exporting energy. And most important, we could be independent of the Middle East. It's all here, and the only problem is our federal government today. Yeah. You're here. Now, to be, now, to really get you, get you going, what's really devious, and I'll even say the word evil about this policy is, it is a transfer of wealth from middle class, lower income Americans' wealth to billionaires in the green energy space. And I'll describe more about that. So they are winners and losers. So when President Obama goes out there and says,
he wants a level playing field to give everybody a fair shot. Think about what he's really doing. Ironically, the first black president is really harming black Americans here, here. the most. Again, he's all doing it through, the, through his regulatory agencies. Let's talk about gasoline. When he first took office, the price of gasoline national average was $1.84 a gallon. Now it's three sixty-two. In New York, it's three eighty-seven. My wife Deneen likes her SUV. It costs us a lot of money to fill that baby up. That takes a huge chunk of money out of everyday Americans' pockets. And here's a nice little stat. For every one cent increase in gasoline, that takes out four million dollars a day out of Americans' pockets. One cent, four million dollars a day. That's over 1.4 billion a year. So you can run your own numbers because we went from 184 to 362. That's a lot of cents. That's hundreds of billions of dollars that people could have in their pockets, but instead are going elsewhere, and some of it's going to the Middle East. And what's really frustrating about this, again, it doesn't hit all Americans the same way. Those on lower and fixed incomes pay a higher percent of their, well, their monthly bottom line, yearly bottom line on energy. And in fact, in 2011, for families making less than $50,000, energy prices have doubled in that time spread. What makes it worse is minority families get hurt the hardest. Black American families have the lowest national average income. So high energy prices takes the biggest chunk out of their disposable income. Primarily, black Americans are being hurt the most. And President Obama, being the compassionate person he is, when asked during the campaign speech, I think it was a campaign speech, asked about the impact, of, uh, the constituent asked about the high price of gasoline, and President Obama's response was, if you're complaining about the price of gas and you're only getting eight miles a gallon, you know, you might want to think about the trading. Wow. Now that's compassion. I don't see him trading in his limo. And after he retires, I'm sure he'll still be in a limo. Oh, yes. And let's not forget, let's not forget, his first energy secretary, Chu, once said he wanted to see gasoline prices in the United States the same as Europe. That's about $8 a gallon. That's from your former Department of Energy. So now you know why we have high gasoline prices. Getting a little closer to Louisiana. We all remember the horrific, you know, Deepwater uh, Horizon rig explosion and that disaster. Obama's first response to that? Moratorium. Put a moratorium on drilling for six months. That's how long it took. Then after the moratorium, the people in industry called it a permatorium. They couldn't get permits. The permit process was slowed down. Again, if you want to increase prices, you keep supply down. Right. Almost every opportunity has come, President Obama has done that. That's right. The Heritage Foundation in 2011 did an analysis and they said that the deep water permits Texas in the, in the Gulf region. It could carry 800,000 barrels of oil per day. <coughs> President Obama has yet to approve this pipeline. One part was approved that didn't need federal approval, I believe, and that went from Oklahoma to Texas. The link from Alberta to Oklahoma has, has to be approved by the has to be approved first by the State Department. Then the State Department and the EPA did not stop it. It's now sitting on President Obama's lap, and he is yet to approve this. If you want to increase price, you keep supply down. Will he approve it? I'm not sure. Personally, I don't think so. If he didn't approve the pipeline during election year, why would he do it now? Why would he do it now? Five, if the pipeline, the northern part, would cost $5 billion of private money, not taxpayer money, private money, and would create 9,000 U.S. jobs through 2015. You know, this almost sounds like one of those MasterCard commercials, priceless. 
right? So if you're buying oil from a friendly neighbor, you're providing thousands of jobs, you don't have the EPA stopping you, you don't have the State Department stopping you, and bringing oil from a friend rather than enemies. That, is, that should be priceless. But it's not. There's something wrong here. There's something very wrong here. Now, a lot of, now, in the headlines, let's talk about our bureaucracy, right? We, we, we've learned recently about what the IRS is doing. Now, obviously what the IRS is doing in, in terms of intimidating Tea Party people is, is obviously outrageous. But what else has the bureaucracy been doing? And what else has the bureaucracy been doing with respect to fossil fuels? A couple of years ago, I believe, there was a Region 6 EPA administrator who was caught on videotape saying, that his philosophy in regulating the oil and nat natural gas industry was to crucify them. We pay these people salary, and his passion was crucifying the job producers, the energy producers. That, ind that individual resigned. I think he went on to a radical environmental group. I'll be shocked. So when you're looking at the IRS, it's not, it's not just one agency. And let's talk about the former EPA administrator, Lisa Jackson. She recently resigned under a cloud of suspicion. Lisa Jackson had an alias email. She was doing government business using an email assigned to Richard Windsor. You're not supposed to do that. This is the people's business. The thought is she was communicating with radical environmental groups using this alias email so that when Individuals wanted to FOIA under the Freedom Information Act. If you put in Lisa Jackson, you get all her emails. But under Richard Windsor, who would have thought of that one? This is this is not again. This is not a low-level bureaucrat. This was the top. So at the top, you have people who are working against your interests, and then the bureaucrats want to crucify the energy producers. There's something very wrong here. Oh, and by the way, news of this week, Lisa Jackson was just hired as the head environmental person at Apple. So after trying to slow down our economy, after trying to harm you and your personal wealth, she gets rewarded at Apple, where no doubt she will become a multi-millionaire. We need accountability, and accountability very soon. Again, big government has its own agenda, and it's not the people's agenda. And if you think the oil industry is being targeted, you really have to take a look at the coal industry. You may remember uh, President Obama, when he was running for president the first time, he said he wanted electricity prices to skyrocket, and that if utility wanted to build a coal-fired power plant, they could, but they would just go bankrupt. Now you have a future president of the United States whose stated policy goal is to bankrupt an industry. Bankrupt them. What he's trying to do there is electricity making the switch again. He wants to bankrupt coal and make electricity through renewable and solar energy. That's his plan sitting there at those switches. He first tried cap and trade legislation, which thank God failed. But when, in this whole process of cap and trade, there were a number of companies that actually lobbied for it. You had some oil companies, believe it or not, some utilities joining radical environmental groups to push for a law to raise energy prices on Americans. It doesn't make a lot of economic sense, but yet they did it. Cap and trade failed, that was the good news. The bad news is he's been using the EPA to regulate the coal industry into bankruptcy. And so what has happened? So far, 285 coal-fired units are going to be closing. Coal production is down to 36%. It used to be 46%. 36% is what we used to do in 1978. Coal mining stocks are being punished. Peabody, used to be the largest coal company, its stock used to be about 70. It's now 20. Patriot Coal did go bankrupt. Thousands of coal miners are losing their jobs. And then paid your coal and bankrupt, now we have the legacy benefits of all these retired coal miners. Who's going to pay for their benefits? Ultimately, it's going to be we the people. 
when you really think about it, in government and politics, it's really no different than sports. They're going to be winners and they're going to be losers. I just described a series of losers. Now let's talk about some of the winners. Clearly, fixed income Americans are really going to be hit the hardest. But tragically and outrageously, it's President Obama's big industry allies and his billionaire buddies are the ones who are profiting from this whole scheme. Companies were rewarded with hundreds of million dollars of grants, tax subsidies, and billions of our dollars really went out the door. In one Department of Energy program, 80% of the stimulus money or the federal money, the grants, went to donors of either President Obama or the Democratic Party. 80% of one DOE program, Department of Energy program. Fortune 500 companies got hundreds of millions of dollars. General Electric got a hundred million dollars in grants from you. General Electric is a profitable company. They pay a dividend. They made $16 billion last year, made, and we subsidized them. Other companies did as well. Now, as we know, some of the green energy companies really did fail. We all remember Solyndra, it's about $529 million, I believe. Uh, they went bankrupt. Uh, battery maker, A123 company, they went bankrupt. Has anyone heard of a company called Fisker Automotive? Okay. Fisker Automotive is another electric car company. We gave them about $400 million. Uh, and they, they owe us about $190 million now in, 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 in loans. They may soon go bankrupt. Do you know who a key investor of Fisker Automotive is? Al Gore and a fellow named John Doerr. John Doerr is a billionaire venture capitalist who started Google and Amazon.com. Congratulations. Our tax money are going to bail out billionaires' bad investments. And this is truly a lose-lose situation. <coughs> Has anyone heard of Tesla Motors? It's another electric car company. Now the good news about Tesla, all of a sudden, is that they've gotten, their stock has rocketed. It's gone from about 25 to 110. Guess what? You're not going to profit in any of that. Their investors are. Does anyone, anyone want to guess who was some of the early investor, investors in Tesla? Not Al Gore this time, but more billionaires. How about the starters of Google? The founders of Google were early investors in Tesla. Now, you'd think they could use their own private money to gamble. They certainly have plenty of it, and they should be investing their own money for the next wave of technology. It shouldn't be we the people money. But this is exactly what's going on. This is an inside game baseball, and we're left out. We're stuck in the stands paying for the entrance fee, but we don't get any enjoyment out of this game. So what we really need to do to grow our economy, we really need to leverage our fossil fuel resources that God has blessed us with. <laughs> Developing these resources, we can create jobs, lower energy prices, and to really start our economy. This isn't the old energy resources. This is the present resources. Let's live in the real world. The International uh, Energy Agency said that we will surpass, surpass excuse me, Saudi Arabia in oil production by the year 2020. So this isn't Tom Borelli saying we, we're the Saudi Arabia of oil. This is an international agency saying that. A Citigroup study said that using our domestic natural resources we could grow our GDP by 3% and create 3.6 million jobs. This is real, it's right here. The only thing blocking us is our own federal government. Just look at the state of North Dakota. They have a booming economy because they've been developing their natural resources, shale oil and gas there. I think their unemployment rate is like two or three percent, and they had a state budget surplus of one billion dollars. That's what fossil fuel resources can do. And it's right here and it's right now. Now as I close, I hope my talk is giving you justification of why you need to get involved, 
why you need to be, uh, get your neighbors involved and, and get going because our country, again, is at a crossroads. We can grow this economy. We need to get this economy going. And if you just think about it, this isn't an issue really of politics. This is fundamentally an issue of right and wrong. So you know, going out there and meeting new people, just ask them, you know, is it right for policies, our government policies, to be designed to benefit billionaire donors to any political party? Is that right or wrong? That should be an easy question to answer. How about the fact of what good comes from advancing policies whose net effect is lowering people's disposable income? Is that right or wrong? Start with the policies. Is it right or wrong to have an energy policy that makes us reliant on the Middle East? Is that right or wrong? What about the policies by design is set out to bankrupt an industry and send people to the unemployment line. Is that right or wrong? And the best thing about this is, you don't have to take my words for it. You can go to YouTube and look up President Obama bankrupting coal, and you will see the YouTube video where he says, bankrupting coal will be a consequence, higher energy prices, and those prices will be passed on to the consumer. <coughs> those are his words, not mine. They know what they're doing, and they're harming all of us, but especially, especially <coughs> the black community. I thank you for your time and for your attention, and perhaps later on there'll be uh, an opportunity for questions. I guess one right now. Uh, Tom, what you're saying is, 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 is earth-shaking. Why don't we hear uh, from whoever uh, that idea of the unemployment rate being not seven point something, but really 37 percent? 20, 62 percent actually working. Why don't we hear uh, what you're saying, the prices of, of oil, uh, of gasoline from 182 to 360, why aren't we hearing this from folks who are supposed to be on our side of the, of the table? Well, a lot of them, frankly, are afraid. Uh, they're afraid because of the green groups. They're afraid of the media. They're not telling you the truth. And that's why we're here. That's why we have Freedom Works. That's why we have uh, media that is on our side. Talk radio is, some of the talk radio programs are great on this issue. This is where I mean, we spend our days listening to this. And it's really important. These are the type of questions that you should be able to ask at town halls. Yes. Why are, why, and there is an effort, and it actually is a bipartisan effort now, to try to get the Keystone Pipeline built. But still, with Harry Reid running the Senate, it's going to be tough. But there is, you know, people complaining about friends and neighbors complaining about gas, asking why isn't the Keystone Pipeline being built? All roads go back to President Obama. But it's a matter of communications. I mean, that's why we're here, to educate you, to motivate you, to infuriate you, to carry this message out. Again, this isn't a Republican or Democrat issue. This is a right or wrong issue. I don't care who is it. There's no way our tax money should be going to profitable industries and or individuals. There's nothing wrong with being a billionaire. God bless. But take that money and reinvest it with, take that business risk again. You did it once. Maybe you can double your billions, but don't use it to harm American people. Right. Um, why does North Dakota have, why are they able to um, use their natural resources when Louisiana can't? Uh, the, the answer to that question is, uh, most it, is, it happened during a debate between Obama and Romney. They had this exchange where Obama claimed he was like, there's more oil produced under his administration. The asterisk that you need to point out is the, the increase in North Dakota is coming from private and state lands. And a lot of the Gulf Coast, you know, the water is fed, need federal permits and an approval. So it's where the federal involvement is that's slowing it down. North Dakota has a lot of state and private land that they're developing, and that's, that's, that's why they've been able to do it.
I do know Senator. I do know Senator Vitter has been excellent on this issue. He's been all over these EPA emails. He's been excellent on this issue. But you do have, uh, you know, Ms. Landrieu, um, and I'm sure she'll do a quick little dance step to say she is really for fossil fuels, just like Senator Joe Manchin is allowing his constituents in West Virginia to be sent to the unemployment line, and he says he's going to, you know, try to stop President Obama. Look at the numbers. Hold them accountable. But yes, uh, a more pro-growth, more pro-energy senator in Louisiana would be a big help. And we have one, one senator who's on the energy committee. Well, that's a very good start. Um, you know, I don't know where to start with this. Coming out of the uh, administration in Washington, I, I can't believe anything they say. I, I hear about a culture of corruption. I think we can maybe call it a culture of mendacity. They live on a line. At one point in, comes to mind right now is they have been telling us for 20 years that carbon in our atmosphere causes global warming. It's never been proven. It's <coughs> been pretty much proven that carbon in the atmosphere has no effect on cooling. And we should be saying that in every, every time they bring it up, we should bring it up and say, hey, Prove it. You're, you're right. The, Prove. The, the mainstream media has, and I believe the Earth, the global temperature hasn't increased in the last, at least the last decade, it's plateaued, which is not what they had expected. Some people think it's going to get colder, but that's, the point is that whenever they say things that they cannot prove, they're just making it up, we need to counter it. Well, and not only that, point, even, even, I do have a background in science and I've done some science communications. The, right. be the beauty of this thing is, these issues are, you don't even have to be a scientist. Let's talk about the process. Yes. My God, why was the EPA administrator having a alias email account? Yeah. Hello? <coughs> what, why? Exactly. And then she's able to leave and go to Apple and we can't hold her accountable. But I, I, feel I mean, like that, that itself is, is outrageous. I feel like they have found a secret formula somewhere well, to, to prevent our side from speaking out. Their secret, their secret formula is trying to make sure you stay dumb and uninformed. Right. That's their formula. And that's why the Tea Party movement is such a threat. That's why meetings like this are such a threat. Because you get to hear from people like us who do this 24 hours a day. And we're here to help. And we'll come back and come back until we get this thing changed. You know, I've been involved in politics a long time and I should know the answer to this question. But as I understand the Constitution and the budgetary process at the federal level, no money is appropriated unless it goes through the House of Representatives. Correct. Now I'm looking for who to blame right now. Now, I don't understand how we're all worried about Obamacare being implemented when any appropriation has to go through the House controlled by the Republicans. I'm trying to understand how the IRS gets an appropriation or the EPA gets an appropriation without strings attached unless it goes through the House which is controlled by Republicans. How do they fund all these? Because I don't really understand how they do it. Well, part of, part of it, you're absolutely right. Part of the problem is part of the Republican Party in the House are frightened. They're afraid of things like government shutdowns or even shutting down the EPA. They're afraid of the blowback that will happen. But that's why we have some of the really you know, conservative Tea Party members who are willing to stand up and just say, no, we need to hold them accountable. All right, so what about Obamacare? How can they fund Obamacare if the House doesn't appropriate the money? They can't, I believe they can. So we don't have to worry about well, healing Obamacare. Part of we it is, have to worry about getting the House Republicans right. funded. Holding your, your, your representatives accountable to the principles is should be our goal. By the way, I believe there is a lawsuit on Obamacare that says it's unconstitutional because it didn't start, the legislation didn't start in the House, it started apparently in the right. Senate. Right. So there's a const there is a lawsuit proceeding. And then in the healthcare exchanges, some of the governors have stood up 
and then not, allow, not allowing the exchanges. But look, again, it really comes back to fundamental accountability. Look at your attorney general, right? Is he going to investigate himself? I mean, this is, this is why we need to get more people involved, to get more excited. The challenge, the challenge we have is really to pick one issue because, you know, they have a blitzkrieg of issues on us. Energy, on IRS, it, it, it's massive. Well, what I'm, here's what I'm saying is, it's so confusing when you look at the array of issues, all the problems that we have, all the issues. We can't get Obama to do the things we want. But we should be able to get House Republicans to do what we want. So shouldn't we be focusing an awful lot of our efforts on getting them Absolutely. to stay true to principle? And, and, that, and a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of organizations like Freedom Works, the Tea Party type organizations and Tea Party members have been actually doing that. And you know, Freedom Works is the organization that actually primary Republicans, right? Senator Mike Lee is senator because of Freedom Works early action in in uh, Utah. Senator Ted Cruz was really an underdog until Freedom Works really did an amazing grassroots effort. But it takes all of us. But you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, can I comment on, on what the senator said over here? I've been studying this. What they did in that first Obamacare where they pushed it through, they self-funded it. In other words, it wasn't the conceptual idea and then the funding came later. They knew that, that the, the Republicans were pushed back. So they self-funded it. So that money was already approved by the, the House and the Senate and the President signed it. So there were a few gaps that they hadn't planned on, which was the, the, the state insurance exchanges, which were not funded. That's why uh, I think Governor Jindo and uh, Governor Bryant have, have put a halt on on that because they could that not. Is the startup money? Doesn't it still have to be appropriated every year? Not that you know that 2,200 page bill that was sitting on the shelf. It was sitting there waiting to be stuffed out our throat. And they have been working on this since Hillary Clinton's uh, uh, health care bill in, what, 93? And they've had all those years with it. So I'm just trying to tell you, our, 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 and this is not trying to cover for any of the, our Republican House guys, because we got some good ones there. But there are only a few gaps that they can stop, and one of those gaps is the insurance exchange. And without the insurance exchange, Obamacare can't work. And also the state Medicare. And the state Medicare, right. So. But right now, we just need to have them stand their, their grounds on those areas, and, and, and we, can, we can stop. Again, well, thank you, and I'll be around if you have any other questions.